Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld, and we're going to be talking about three very important themes that relate directly to the central meaning of Easter. One, the problem of sin. Why is it that Christians think that sin is such an important issue? Second, the issue of the cross of Jesus. Why is it so important for there to be a bloody cross when it comes to our forgiveness? And the third issue is the resurrection or the empty tomb. What is it about the resurrection that is so precious for every single believer? Why do we make that the center of our faith? So stay with us. We're going to have a wonderful time as I interview Daryl Johnson. It's important to face these realities because unless we do, we'll never know what to do next. Well, it's a joy. Daryl Johnson. Oh, it's my joy, John. It's great to be with you. I need to introduce you and make sure that everyone understands who you are. So I've got a little uh, biography paper about you. Theologian, writer, pastor, speaker. Great. That's a a great uh, introduction to who you are. I see there are a number of books that you've written, uh, and they include uh, Discipleship on the Edge, which I really enjoyed. It's a commentary on the book of Revelation. Well done. Thank you for that one. Uh, But you have a number of others experiencing the Trinity, Jesus the healer, um, who is Jesus, uh, a number of those. And I recognize looking at it now that I have actually read who is Jesus as well. So thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, You've been a pastor for how how long have you pastored? 50 years. 50 years. Yep. I was just down in California. Uh, The church I began at had 150th anniversary. And they asked me to come, and I was able to say 50 years ago, I preached my first sermon right here. It's a clumsy sermon. Wow. But I, you know, I've grown some since then. Yeah. Not as clumsy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's very humbling to realize I've been doing this a half a century. Yeah. Now, I have a special memory about, you know, going through a difficult time in my life personally and sitting at the back where you preached, and you preached a number of sermons through John 17. Mm. Uh, come listen as Jesus prays for you. And my wife would hold my hand, and I would weep as you minister to my soul. So I feel like I owe you a a debt of gratitude for your ministry into my life. Um, And I must say, and I would say this to anyone who asks me, and I've told many people this, Daryl, I think you're one of the finest preachers that we have in this country. Thank you for your commitment to expositional, verse-by-verse Bible teaching, which you've done, I think, for most of your life. I have. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. That's and, kind of you. Uh, you've also taught at Regent College, and I think you still teach there on occasion. Part-time. Part-time, yeah. So there are a number of things that you do, including being an international speaker. I know you're headed off to China very, very Hong soon. Hong Kong. Uh-huh. Or Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, you've got so many different hats that you wear. Um, but thank you for wearing this hat today. So let's, let's begin, I think, the place where we should begin. Daryl, I think that to speak about Jesus hanging on the cross, dying for our sins, I think we need to start with, a, with the idea of sin. It's that nasty three-letter word. You know, we have expletives in our culture. I think sin is an expletive. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes, it's very offensive, especially here in Canada, in Vancouver, where I live. That's a very offensive word. Why is it offensive? Well, because it... it, it puts things into our face. People know, I think, that something's wrong. Uh I think any thinking person senses that we're off. We're not what we are supposed to be. They wouldn't say what we were created to be, but there's a sense that we humans are not what we realize we can be. Something is wrong. Um, the, the, The word sin then names it a little bit too harshly. You'd rather just be, well, we, uh, we, we lack education or we don't have enough power or uh, if we can just make circumstances right, we'll, we'll do better. But sin says, no, it's, it's deeper. Yeah. It's something much more fundamental. Well, maybe sin is, is difficult because it implies that see, if the problem is a lack of education, we can, we can solve that. We can that. solve it. If I have a low self-esteem and I'm not feeling good about myself, I mean, perhaps I can see a therapist. Right. But if I've got a sin problem, I need a savior. You need a savior. So let's talk about what is sin? What, what are we talking about? Well, the first time someone really put that to me was my first visit to Beijing huh. a number of years ago. Uh, one afternoon, um, this young student showed up at the apartment where I was staying 
a young psychology student. He had heard that there was a, a Christian scholar in town. I didn't think of myself as a Christian scholar. I was, I'm a preacher. Mm-hmm. At any rate, he wanted to talk to me, he had a bunch of questions. Someone had given him a Bible and he was reading through the Bible and he was really troubled. He says, I, 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 I don't understand this word sin. Mm-hmm. So here I am at Beijing in this apartment. We have a chance to talk about that. So I was able to say to him that in the Bible, there are three levels to the concept of sin and three different words, sin, transgression, Mm -hmm. and iniquity. Mm -hmm. And they're right there in Psalm 32, Psalm 52, 51, I mean. 51, yes. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And as you know, the Psalms use those three words over and over again. So we walk through that and I said, sin, is a, the garden variety word for what's wrong with us. We keep missing the mark. As you know, it's, it's the word that a, 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 is used about an archer who pulls back yep. the, and shoots the arrow and misses the mark. And he goes, I get that. I'm always doing that. And I think most people do. I said, but when you go deeper, you get to transgression or trespasses. It's sometimes you come up to a sign that says no trespassing and you do it anyway. Uh, You walk through that. Uh, The contemporary um, example of that would be don't use your cell phone when you're driving. You you know that this is good. This is dangerous. You can put other people's lives in harm. You know it's wrong, but you still do it. You walk right through the sign and you do it. So it's a knowing action. Now, see, a a missing of the mark. I'm trying to hit it, but I miss it. It could be just a mistake. It's a mistake. Yeah. Um, No big deal. Humans make mistakes. It could be that. But transgression is more voluntary. And actually, it should be translated rebellion because when you come across a sign, no trespassing into this land, you're not only violating the sign, you're going against the authority of the person who put the sign. Right. So actually, you're defaming the person who made that sign. And he says, well, I, I, I get that too. I said, when there's, then the third level is this word iniquity. And I told him, it's really hard to translate but um, the idea in the Hebrew is twistedness, um, even more offensively, a pervertedness. There's this thing in us that makes us keep missing the mark. There's this thing in us that makes us want to press through the no trespassing sign. Um, and it's deep. And he says to me, that's what's ruining China. And for that, China needs a savior. Wow. And then I've got to leave and lead him to Jesus. But that was a great insight to me yeah. in his processing. That's what's ruining Canada. Yeah, yeah. And for that, Canada needs savior because you, you might be able to work hard and not miss the mark again. You might be able to. Uh-huh. And you might be able to, well, okay, I, I, I'm, I see that no trespass sign. I, I won't do it. I'll, I'll steal myself and not do it. But there's this thing in us. Um, and that can't be solved by ourselves. That We need help with that. Um, and I find that when I walk through that with even the most, uh, a person who has no biblical background, no theological background, most people go, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's something really fundamentally off about us and we can't rescue ourselves. We need help from outside. Now the mark yep. um, that I'm shooting at, I mean, I think it has to be defined because hmm. Daryl, would you say that the mark is God's law. I mean, isn't sin at all points in time a violation of divine law? Yes. So God in the law yeah. has given us a picture of the target. Yeah. Well, or to put it even more redemptively, a picture of who he has created us to be. Yeah. Correct. So even though we may not, as Paul says, have access to God's law still... God has written a law in the conscience and in the heart so that intuitively we have this this inner sense that I have missed the mark and it's universal, don't you think? Oh, I think so. Well, look at the way people are are reacting to uh, decisions and actions that superstars and and politicians in our time make. Uh, We used to live, you are innocent before uh, until proven guilty right now. You're guilty, and you've got to prove yourself innocent. So there's this, 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 this conscience in the society that there's something right and something wrong. And man, it's fierce. 
So the people recognize implicitly that there are statutes, as the psalmist say. These, these, that word means grooves. God has built into us a way to live that is, re, that is redemptive and whole, and, and we keep violating it. And we keep violating it. I think that's the issue. No matter how hard we continue to pound down on, because you're talking about now a culture that doesn't want to use the word sin and yet sees violence done. I mean, whether it's abuse of women in the Me Too movement yeah. or you have, uh, you know, some kind of a political, you know, lying or abusing power. I mean, that's always a big issue. So we're hard on that, but we want to use a different word for it. Yeah. Daryl, I think it's because we want to keep God out of the equation. It's just a human problem and it's not between us and God. Right. Okay, you agree with that. So I, that there's, yeah, there's just still this sense we can make this work. Give us enough time. We're going to make it work. And over 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 again, we can't. Yeah. No matter how many Pharisees we raise up <laughs> to give us more rules and tell us what we must do. It's all of no avail. We need somebody outside of us to get this thing out of us. Let's talk about a savior. Um, and I, Daryl, there's 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 a thing that bothers some people about Easter, and it's because the thing is bloody. You know, it's uh, it's this awful sacrifice of Jesus, and it rises out of a Bible that's got blood from you know it's from the sacrificial ritual. And by the way, I was reading one commentary recently which said that Leviticus is one of the most important books in the entire Bible because the context of the entire cross can't make sense. And we don't have that. It's a book about very difficult to read, but it's got sacrifices and you've got peace offerings and guilt offerings and sin offerings. You know, you've got offering after offering to appease the deity. So here's the question I want to start with. Why, why can't God just say, you got the, you're missing the mark and you got a bent in your character that's causing you to do this? Why don't you just reach down and fix that without appealing to this bloody cross? What's the problem here? <laughs> <laughs> so well put. Yeah. And that is the great offense. It's going to take some time for us to unpack that. We need to take the time. I mean, we can we can cite biblical verses. Let's do that. But it, you know, we have to explain them. Yeah. Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Of course, that's building on all of the background of Leviticus. Yeah. Um, I, 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 an approach that I take in this conversation is to to back up a bit. I've been living with a presupposition since I lived in, in the Philippines. We lived there 1985 to 1989, one of the most transformative times in my life. Scripture came alive to me in ways that I don't think could have just living in the West. I developed the conviction then that the myths of ancient cultures and modern cultures are in touch with truth. The myths distort the truth, um, subvert the truth, but fundamentally, there, there's something they're in touch with, which, is, which explains why people get captured by them. We aren't that dumb that we get captured by total falsehood. So there's yes. some truth in all these myths. So, for instance, um, every ancient culture has a myth about a universal flood. Yeah. Why? <laughs> there was <laughs> a flood. Um, every culture has myths about extraterrestrial beings who come to the earth. Why? Because as a matter of fact, we need help from outside ourselves. Huh. You know, this whole superhero craze that my grandkids, they're, they implicitly know we can't do this. And so there's all, in all these cultures that, that sense that somebody from outside is going to come and, and rescue us. And there is in every culture this myth that a sacrifice has to be given to the deity in order to, for that deity to be pleased with us. Why? Why is that in just every culture? Because it's true. Um, we have offended the living God and something needs to be done about that. For God to just 
willy-nilly forgive us is to raise a whole lot of problems. For God just to say, well, I just forgive you. It, it looks like, A, God is condoning our sin. Yeah. And B, it looks like God is not dealing with us as, as, as responsible moral creatures. It's like, oh, well, boys will be boys, girls will be girls. It's no big deal. So actually, for God to just say, well, let's just forget it, wipe it off, um, is an insult to the dignity of the human being. Um, it's just to say, well, you don't matter. Your decisions don't matter. I, let me let me interject here because it seems to me getting back to the problem of the of the star or the athlete or the politician that has sinned, you know, and they come and they will say, "I'm sorry," but the culture as a whole seems to be saying, "That's not good enough." Yeah. You know, I just and and <laughs> something ought to be good enough. I think we know that something ought to be, but we can't put our finger on what it is. And you're telling me that ancient cultures understood blood has to be shed at some level because it's not good enough until blood is shed. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. It's, that's a brilliant insight. Well, now, That's exactly... Let me, let me just add a couple of things to that. I'm going to say that for us, <clears throat> we all know that in order to live, something has to die. Um, I, you know, even if you're a vegetarian, well, death has to happen at a microbial level. You don't get away with not death. I mean, death happens so that we can live. And it seems to me that's the heart of the Christian message as well. We can't live spiritually unless a Savior would die for us. We'll die. Uh, it's either we're going to die or the Savior will die, but there's going to be death. And the sin question, the death question, I, mean, I think they're, they're all related, don't you think? Very good. Yeah. Well, I, I think this, you're, you're <clears throat> talking about our, where we are as a contemporary culture, where you said people say, no, you can't just let these guys off. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's, our, there's our hook. Why? <laughs> Why? Because you in your heart know that the universe is constructed in such a way that there has to be a response to this sin. Yeah. Somewhere there has to be something done about it. So let's talk about the cross of Jesus. And, and Daryl, what does the Bible have to say about the cross? I mean, the Bible tells us that Jesus died on a cross. Um, it tells us that he laid down his own life willingly no fact, one took his life from him. Yeah. In fact, as you read through that, the accounts of, the, of Passion Week, it's clear that Jesus was pushing his enemies so far. They pretty well had no, uh, there was no alternative but to, to nail him to a cross. They, he, he hadn't given them any other option. But when it's all said and done and we look at the cross, uh, Paul says, you know, he, he boasts in the cross. I mean, he finds it a lovely thing. And yet when I look at the cross, it seems like a, it seems like a very difficult thing. What does the Bible teach us is the meaning of the cross? How much time do you have? <laughs> we need to take all the time that we need because this there's, is central to Easter. There's so many dimensions to what's happening there. I, for me, the most helpful is to go to the words Jesus himself is speaking while on the cross. And in particularly, particularly, what is this, the sixth or seventh word? I'm not sure. It's the, the, I think the last word is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Yeah. So probably the one before that is, it is finished. Yeah. So what is finished? I think what Paul looks at the cross, he sees in that bloody event something finished, something that's been done. And the way I would put it, um, not necessarily in biblical terms here now, everything that needs to be done in order for unholy sinners to be in relationship with a holy God has been done. Everything's been done. Everything's been done. And that's why Paul rejoices in that. Now, then you start saying, okay, what's been done? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, whatever needed to be done about the great offense of the cross has been done. Paul in Romans 3, should, let me just read that passage. Yes. I think this is at the heart of it. Um, so Romans 3, you know it well. I'm sure you've preached on it many times. I think if you're not preaching Romans 3, you're not preaching, are you? I mean, it's well, I think it's, the, it's at the heart of the cross. So I would say to our 
friends who are going to be preaching at this time go there. Yes. Um, and it's, it's tough stuff. Um, well, it seems like every word in Romans 3 is kind of like a bomb. You have to stop <laughs> and consider every one. They're so weighty. Um, that's a weighty chapter. So I'll read those three yep. or six verses here. Romans 3, 21 to 26. You know it well. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Why? Propitiation, as you know, is a, a word that many, even in the Christian world, don't want to use. They want to use expiation. Yeah. Expiation means to put a cover over the sin, so it's no longer a problem. So if this is sin, I, I'm going to put a blanket over top. I'm not looking at it anymore. And so, and, it's been and taken in, away. And in fact, that, that expiation is true. Yes. The blood of Jesus Christ does deal with that, so it's not a problem with it. But uh, as J.I. Packer says, expiation is only half of the good news. Propitiation means that the problem inside God about that has been dealt with. Not only has that been covered, but something inside God has been dealt with. Uh -huh. Whom God displayed public as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Now, this was to demonstrate his righteousness, to demonstrate something about the character of God, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. Meaning that God didn't zap us the minute we committed those sins. That's what Paul's wrestling with, yeah. right? He's wrestling with the fact that it appears that over history, the righteous, holy God has not been faithful to his own character. Only two times in history really has he, Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood, yeah. has God demonstrated what holiness ought to do. So Paul is wrestling with, oh my goodness, over all this period of time, God has not dealt with him, his own self. Am I making sense? He's not, he has not been faithful to what he really ought to do about sin. Um, and so now Paul rejoices in the cross because finally God now does. God now does what God should have been doing for all these centuries about sin. And he does it in crucifying his son. And who is his son but himself? His son is not a third party. Yes, very good. The, the, the son, so the idea of cosmic child abuse, which sometimes oh, gets, which gets thrown at the feet of Christians that, you know, here this brutal father would have treated his son so badly. No, the, the son is the embodiment of the father who comes out of the father, comes to the world and gives himself for the life of the world. So what God should have done all those years, God now does. And that, I think that's why Paul rejoices. This sin has been propitiated once and for all. Let's, let's, let's just slow that process down because this is so important. Uh, first of all, when you said God should have done this, he only twice, you know, at the flood and uh, at Sodom and Gomorrah actually acted and poured out judgment. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that because they think God should have treated us better than we're getting treated. I mean, at one point in time, I can't remember the name of the faith, famous atheist, um, Bertrand Russell, who said, if I ever see God, I will shake a cancerous bone in his face and demand why. So God, you've come up short. But you're saying, well, the charge could go the other way. Why is it that everyone doesn't have a cancerous bone in every part of their body given our sin? Why hasn't judgment fallen on all of us? Deborah, yeah, that's a fascinating thought because I think there are going to be a lot of people that are surprised to hear God spoken of in this way. We say, how can God be good if he does not forgive everybody? Correct. Paul and the biblical authors say, how can God be God and forgive anyone? Yes. Given 
the nature, the holiness of God, the purity of God. Sin is an offense to the holiness of God. I, I, I don't, I, it's, it's hard to put that without it seeming God is egotistical. A better way to say that is holiness by its very nature reacts against everything that is unholy. And that's loving because God knows that unholiness is going to ruin us. <laughs> um, so God's character demands that something be done about this unholiness. And something was done, and the reason why God passed over sins is because of that thing that you've just read, and the word you used was propitiation. That God was going to deal with it. He was going to deal with it and dealt with it at the cross. So is that our answer to why a bloody cross? Yeah, there's still a mystery to it all, but yes, yes. In other words, there's more to be examined yet. It doesn't completely explain. It's a part of the explanation. Is that what you're saying to me? Yeah. I'm thinking in terms of concentric circles. Okay. So the cross is accomplishing a whole bunch of things. <laughs> the cross is accomplishing. Jesus being crucified is accomplishing a whole bunch of things. A cross doesn't accomplish anything. The Savior on the cross accomplishes. So, so I, I can see all these concentric circles. At the heart of it is propitiation. Yeah. Then the next circle would be victory yeah. over the powers that seek to ruin us. So are we now speaking about satanic powers? What kind of powers are we talking about? Well, okay. Uh, the three big powers are sin, evil, and death. Uh -huh. And he wins the victory over sin. Yep. He wins the victory over evil. Just before Jesus goes to the cross, John 12, Jesus says, now the ruler of this world has been cast out. I think he's looking to the cross, not the resurrection. That's when he's going to win over evil. Um, Mel Gibson's... Uh, Passion of the Christ. Passion of the Christ. Not everybody liked that film, but there was an amazing point in the film. The moment Jesus dies, there's this creature that goes, that starts to, there's this whirling sound. Oh! And it, and it goes down. And, and if you have to play it back to, you can, you can miss that. In the moment he dies, this creature who's been in the movie yep. is a snake, yep. is the evil one. I think that's Gibson's way of saying, when Jesus died, evil knew it lost. Uh -huh. And it's screaming now. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. Had, the, had evil known who this was, it wouldn't have killed him. Right. Because in killing Jesus, evil gets overcome. So he overcomes sin, overcomes evil, and he overcomes death. Uh, death is the great enemy, and he wins the victory over death in the moment that he dies. Yes, we're going to talk about the resurrection and in a, in a bit because that is key and central to the entire uh, story of the crucifixion. And yet, let's not leave the, the dying of Jesus for just a moment because I think what you're saying as you, you know, you've put propitiation, which um, the satisfaction of God's righteous judgment is taken care of. Praise God, it's done. It's done so that I could actually say now, once Christ's crucifixion is applied to me, once I have come to believe truly in Christ as in my Savior, there's no more barrier between God and I. There's nothing left to deal with because it's been dealt with. It's been dealt with. That's a fascinating liberty because I think all of us have this, it don't quite make the grade. You know, our culture says, well, just think better of yourself. But I do, but I still have a niggling feeling in the back of my mind that it's not really taken care of. But I could look at that and say, well, then whatever is lacking in me and whatever transgressions and whatever bent of character I have, it is satisfied in the judgment on the cross. Absolutely. It's a remarkable freedom. Absolutely. Daryl, then, if anyone hopes in Christ, is there any sin left to be unpunished in them? I mean, is, are they to be punished for any sin at all? Ah. No. Yo, that's liberty. No. All punishment, you talked about it is finished. All punishment is now resolved. Christ is born at all. He's born at all. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Wesley kept saying. 
Um, uh, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? It goes on, who died for me, set me free from all of that. No condemnation now I dread. Yeah. Jesus and all in him is my living head. Old I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. It's, it's all been done. And it's, it's I just, I, I've been thinking about this for a half a century and I still am just awed by that, that I can walk into the face now into the presence of all that holiness yeah. and not get fright because everything that needed to be done about my sin has been done huh. by the one who is in the middle of all that holiness, who came from the middle of all that holiness, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world who's covered it all for me. Well, there's so much here, Daryl, and I, and I want to get to the resurrection as quickly as we can, but I, I, I feel like I want to push this freedom from condemnation. Um, we're both pastors. We've had numerous occasions to deal with people who are guilt-ridden. I think of a woman who um, uh, had a sexually promiscuous life and then had what? Gloriously saved, come to put her faith in Christ, uh, found a marvelous man. That they got married and she was expecting their first child. And she began to have this niggling fear and doubt. Maybe I'm going to have... Uh, a child that's got problems, it's going to be a, a, you know, a special needs child because God still remembers all those sins that I committed. Um, you and I know as pastors, that's not an unusual story. Oh, not at all. There are all sorts of people and it, it, it finds its way in numerous different ways. I, I think about the amount of times that somebody has said um, to somebody who's become sick, you know, maybe God is punishing you. What have you done? Uh, I have a memory of my own father on his deathbed who loved Christ and held to the cross and understood it fully. But he was suffering for quite some time and he said at one point in time, John, do you think there's, maybe I'm suffering for a sin. It's amazing how quickly these words come out of even believing lips, this sudden overwhelming of unbelief that has difficulty with what you've just said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, it happens all the time. Um, my, our, we have four adopted children. And our fourth we adopted from um, Moscow in Russia. And in 1999, he was um, 19 years old then, uh, he went hiking up in the mountains and he fell off a 120-foot cliff, wow. went into a coma, was in six months rehab. And the second or third day, uh, one of the elders, a good friend of mine from the church came to see me at the hospital. Lot, we were flooded with people at the hospital coming to see us and, see, and to see our son. He says, let's go have coffee. I said, oh, that'd be great. So we're walking down the hall. He puts his arm around me. He says, Daryl, we've, we've had a close relationship these years. You can confess whatever sin it was wow. that caused your son to fall off the cliff. So it, it just escapes. I mean, there's, he just, you, you tell people over and over again, the cross exonerates you before God. The cross exonerates you before God. You are forgiven. Jesus' blood has covered it all. And then in a moment's notice, without even a blink of an eye, we say it's all a lie. It can't be true. Yeah, I must have some hidden sin as a father that resulted in my son falling off the cliff. Of course, I wanted to punch his lights out yeah, well. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Uh, but we just had this conversation about this. And I said, that, that's just not so. We are living in a broken world. Things happen. They do. Yeah. All, all of our suffering is due to sin. Yeah. Right? It, we live in a broken world, but there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, my sickness and my sin. Uh, we, we live in that kind of world. I, I, so I took him and I would take your friend yeah. to the text in Second Corinthians. And you know that one well too. Um, all these things were a new creation are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then this line ought to be sung from the mountaintop. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses oh. against them. Oh. Oh, glory. Uh, All those times I pressed through the no trespassing sign. I, I'm assuming you have too. <laughs> All those times over all the years. Yeah. 
your, your temptation is to think, oh, there's a ledger. Yep, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And Paul is saying, no, not counting yeah. them against us. Um, I think of, of Colossians. Uh, it's okay to keep flipping around here. Yeah. Uh, Colossians 2, um, uh, 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Paul has this picture of uh, this oh. card with all the things we've done on it. Having canceled it out, which was hostile toward us, tell me about it. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Whatever it is that I've done is there, and it's no longer counted against us. See, I have this vision here of, because I, I think the he and him in the Colossians passage, the father who has kept a record of every single transgression. Nothing has escaped his notice. He forgets nothing. He has no shortage. He's got no memory pl- uh, problems. He's, you know, he's, he, old age isn't affecting him. He, he remembers everything. So he takes the full record of all that, Daryl, you and I have done, which have offended holiness, broken and violated his law, done against his will. Hurt other people. Hurt other people, everything. And he nailed it to the cross of Jesus and said, there, it's satisfied. It's a remarkable thing. The, the, the freedom, if we... If we actually live within the cross, we live with that. Uh, Daryl, here I'm reminded of the end of John six. You'll you'll remember, you know, that uh, many of Jesus' disciples no longer followed him. They found his words so offensive, and then he says to the twelve, "You do not also want to leave, too, do you?" And and I notice that the actual Greek rendering expects a response. It, it respects a no response. He knows they're not going to leave him. When he asks that, he's asking them to give this affirmation. Hmm. And Peter, speaking for the others, said, where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Uh, I think he's saying, you know, if if it was a matter of just having a good self-esteem or if uh, I want political answers to my problems and get rid of the Romans, well, there are opportunities and alternatives out there. But when it comes to eternal life... There's nowhere else to go. Can we rightly say, Daryl, that this message that we're talking about, the cross, it's found nowhere else? Nowhere else. Nowhere else. It's in Jesus alone. Alone. I I won't be able to quote this correctly, but someone once said, um, if salvation is um, being faithful to the ancestors, then Shintoism saves. Yes. If salvation means you've reached some state of illumination, then perhaps Buddhism saves. If salvation means union with the cosmic all, then maybe Hinduism saves. If salvation means deliverance from the bourgeoisie oppression, then maybe Marxism saves. If salvation means well-being, then maybe capitalism saves. If salvation means feeling good, then maybe partying saves. But... If salvation means freedom from sin and evil and death, only Jesus saves. There are no other options. Nobody, well, nobody ever claimed to do that. No, no other would-be savior even thinks in those terms. Only Jesus of Nazareth does. So there's, there's freedom from sin, freedom from evil, and even freedom from the power of death yeah. only in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Well, let's, even though there's so much more to talk about, I mean, I think the mystery of the cross, I wonder whether or not it's going to take eternity to try to plumb the depths of of where this all leads us. But let's move from the cross to the empty tomb. Maybe it'd be one thing to simply say, well, it's a nice ending to the story, but it's more than a nice ending to the story, isn't it? Isn't there, even as we've talked about significance of the bleeding and dying of our Savior, is there not a significance to the empty tomb. And where would we begin to go for that? Well, as soon as you move to the resurrection, I, I want to go back to the cross uh-huh. for just a moment. It's okay? Yes. Um, because I grew up with the sense that Good Friday is the defeat. Easter morning is the victory. Uh-huh. That's not true. We, well, Easter's victory. Good Friday is the victory. And the text that comes to my mind is Matthew chapter 28. 
Jesus cries out again with a loud voice. He yields up his spirit. And behold, that's Matthew's way of saying, pay attention. And every time he uses the word behold, it's always a surprise. Hmm. Behold, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. Access into the holiness has been given to us. There's no more barrier. The earth shook. The rocks split. And the tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Boy, is that a mystery, a text. Some commentators say, Matthew got it wrong. That should be on Easter morning. No, it's on Good Friday. The moment Jesus dies, he wins the victory over death. I had a mentor who said to me, when death stung Jesus Christ, it stung itself to death. And the moment he dies, the power of death has lost its strength and couldn't hold the dead in anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a remarkable moment then. And it tells you why we use the word Good Friday rather than Dark Friday. Absolutely. Look at all that's happening. The, the, that curtain, it's a thick curtain that separates a sinful humanity from a holy God has been removed, torn from top to bottom, not from the bottom up. Yeah. Again, a signal, we don't, win. we don't win this victory. We don't save ourselves. It's God who tears that down. So there's no more, no more separation. There's no more separation. But because of Good Friday, there's nothing in the way. There's nothing in the way. You know, on the Jewish Day of Atonement, of course, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, the only day of the year he was permitted to go. Uh, and he would go in uh, carrying the blood of a sacrificed animal and make atonement, recognizing that um, he, you know, he approaches with, with fear and trembling before the altar of God, uh, and he pleads with God for mercy on behalf of his people. Um, what you now have, if that curtain which held the high priest out is now been torn and says to every single believer in Jesus' cross for salvation, Enter boldly now, rather than with fear and trembling. Enter boldly. Come. Nothing holds you back. Nothing in the way. Um, Nothing in the way. That, well, that's the book of Hebrews. So the idea of a, going into prayer and being overwhelmed by, even after my salvation, I still recognize, Daryl, I still recognize I sin. Mm -hmm. But even now, all my sins in the present hour, even those would not withhold me from the throne room of God. No. He's, I, I, that's the book of Hebrews. Yeah. We may boldly enter. <laughs> that boldly is a, is a hard word for us Canadians. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to practice boldness, but that's what the writer's saying. No, you can, you can come. You can come. The Father's heart is open wide. Yeah. Everything's been done. Just press in. There is no curtain. There's no separation. There's none. <laughs> so all that's been accomplished. All that's been accomplished. So, so what's Easter morning so about? What, well, why do we need Easter morning? Well, because we want the Savior to be alive. Yeah. He's not a dead Savior any, anymore. He's now, uh, he's now risen. Now, there are a whole bunch of consequences of Easter now. Just as we could spend hours on the cross, we can spend hours, days on the resurrection. So what, what happened? Well, we don't know the mystery of what happened to his body, but, well, first of all, death has met its match. Finally, there's one person it could not hold down. That, that, that's, that's already because death, I mean, you know, we, we talk in our culture, you know, the two constants, death and taxes, right? We talk about that. Um, so we know that death awaits us all and death has the final word, yes? I mean, up until the resurrection of Jesus, we would say that, would we not? We'd say that. So death has met its match. So the second thing I would want to say then, death no longer has the last word. It only gets the second to the last word. The, the last word now is life, <laughs> which means then that Easter means we no longer have to live in the fear of death. I, I, I think all fear is rooted in the fear of death. So Daryl, let's now, I mean, Christ uh, died for our sins. So, you know, if this is a victory, why do we even need Easter now? Uh, because it would seem that with everything that we've said, it ought to be done. I mean, Jesus dies on the cross and I guess just 
wakes up in heaven. I mean, why do we need an empty tomb? The empty tomb now is the, how would, how would I put it? The um, manifestation of the victory and now the working out the implications of the victory. And so Easter now moves us into the consequences of it is finished. God has done everything that needs to be done about sin. So what? Ah, now yeah. we get to enter into the life that God has always wanted for us, that Jesus now brings into being because he's alive. Um, and there's so, like, like the cross has these concentric circles yes. of all the things that are accomplished. So the resurrection uh, has a multiple levels that you, could, you can celebrate um, on Easter. Death has met its match. Finally, finally death did not win. So, yeah, that's what we always talk about, that death and taxes, you know, I mean, those are yeah. the constants in life and you can never get beyond death and taxes. So uh, we've, we've, we've heard that and we all live, do we all live with a fear of death? I mean, is Absolutely. That- I think all fear is rooted in the fear of death. So we got this bravado sometimes that we, we do, but it kind of masks this underlying deep anxiety that with every year that goes by, I'm reaching this, this abyss or, um, you know, it's not like my road is, is taking me into beautiful places. It's a cul-de-sac. It comes to a screeching halt. It's the end of it. But the resurrection says something else. The resurrection says death only gets the second to the last word. And the last word is life. So over Jesus, he only had the second to the last word. And the last word now is he's alive. And in relationship with Jesus, I think is what scripture is telling us, in relationship with Jesus, that's true too. I'm going to die, uh, but it's only the second to the last word. The last word will be I'm, I'm alive. And if I know that death isn't the end, it's, it's moving into a, a life that now um, doesn't end. In fact, it, it, it's an end of one kind of life and the beginning of another kind of life. Um, and the more I meditate on that and the more I live with that, the, more I'm, I, the less afraid I am. I can, I can tell you, John, I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid. Concerned about dying. <laughs> and I, I've been with too many people whose dying process is just so excruciating. And I, and you've probably done this in hospital too. You just pray, Lord, please just end this. Mm-hmm. Take them because it's better. So I, I am concerned about that and I don't want to go through that. But I, I, I know that, that when my heart stops pumping and I, I stop breathing, I'm going to be all right. Because that's... Is now I'm moving into what Jesus has moved in, into that resurrected life. I think we're talking about something that, you know, the Bible writers talk about is union with Christ. We are in Christ so that our future and Christ's future are melted together. Yes. Um, they are the same future. So I think that's what you're saying to me, that his resurrection is also yours and my resurrection. Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, that would turn us to 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. And that, those lines where Paul talks about, in Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. Uh-huh. So in Adam means you know, you've got our first, you know, some people use the word federal head of the human race. So you have our representative. He dies and I am in union with him. So I follow his lead and follow him into death. So now I have another representative head. I've transferred from one camp to another one. I've changed my jersey. Preach it. Hallelujah, right? Yes. And now I've got, I've got Christ as my representative head, so it ends now. In life. In life. Let's talk, yeah, let's talk about more because if all of these things are true now, Christ was not just raised spiritually, he's raised bodily. Yes. What, what is this, the bodily resurrection? Why is this so important for Christians? Well, because we are embodied creatures. Oh. We were, God made us with bodies, Genesis 2, uh, and was pleased with that. We will, and, and, and we, were, we were made to be um, a psychosomatic, mental, psychological whole, <laughs> however you put uh-huh. that together. This body in Adam is decaying. Yeah. But in the new Adam, in the second Adam, we're given a body that does not decay, a body like his, uh, a body that 
we can't even imagine a body that doesn't get sick. It doesn't decay. I, I mean, I, See, I, I can use noticed, the words, but I can't imagine what that's like. I also noticed that Jesus, you know, he goes, you know, the place where he was uh, and he ate fish. He ate with his disciples. There's this tactile touch and feel. Um, so he, he seems to experience bodily life. Daryl, here's what I've noticed about all of, you know, whenever Hollywood depicts heaven, I, I find that, you know, it's, everything's white. <laughs> <laughs> and the clothing they wear is white. And there seems to be, cl- uh, you know, some kind Clouds. of a fog that comes about up to the ankles and maybe higher. And, uh, <laughs> and because we have difficulty with this. But a world that is fully physical with sights and sounds and smells and tastes and all of that kind of stuff. I think that's there in the resurrection of Jesus. It's a full bodily human existence rather than we move from a human existence to who knows what, yes? Yes. I think one of the reasons even Christians fear death is because they think suddenly it's going to be unhuman or inhuman in the life to come. Yeah, fuzzy, um, ethereal. Um, I'm, I'm not attracted to that. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so Easter means, let's, let's try this. Easter is God's uh, validation of the goodness of a, being an embodied creature. <sighs> because the second person of the Trinity became human at Christmas dies and is resurrected a new human and will always be in his body. He is right now and always will be. That's a way of saying bodiliness is good yeah, and yeah. eternal. And, and then somehow we're brought into that and, and we get to live in that kind of reality. And again, it's hard to imagine. Revelation 21 and 22 talks about a city. I don't think that's just a metaphor. Right. Uh, Cityness is about recognizing um, embodied creatures who do things with their hands, who build things, who, etc. So, um, so Easter morning is um, more than just one man came back. Yeah, it's the man, the new Adam, who's come back, and now just as we inherited the legacy of the first Adam, we inherit the legacy of the second Adam, and that includes a new body. Now, when we get that new body, that's part of the mystery. But one day we do. Now, so there's that hope that we have that lies beyond the grave. But sometimes when I'm reading through Scripture, I also find that the resurrection life of Jesus is in some fashion applied to me even now already. It's as if, well, it's like a down payment. It's like I've received a foretaste of that which is to come. Can you unpack that a little for us? I mean, what... What do believers get now from the resurrection of Jesus? Ah, ah, good question. Well, the living presence of the living Jesus. That's the big thing we get. I will never leave you or forsake you. He's with us in some way. And how that works is a mystery. And of course, the, the, the scriptures answer that through the power of his spirit. And it's, his spirit makes Jesus real and present to us. But that's the first gift we're given, himself. So let me get personal. Do you sense Jesus with you? Not all the time, yeah. but yes. See, because it seems to me that if, if we have a living Jesus, it, he should be in some sense, that there should be an awareness. I mean, I, I think I, that's a very honest answer, but, but there are times when you sense very deeply that he is right at hand. Even now. When I was a little boy, my Swedish grandmother who led me to Jesus when I was three years old. Uh, So I've been walking with him like 68, 69 years. Uh, Her favorite hymn was, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other, never known. And so there are moments when, yeah, he's very close at hand. I wish we could live in that space all the time I think in my case, it tends to immobilize me. <laughs> and I, I get too weepy, so I'm not, probably not any good for anybody else. But yeah, that's the promise. He's with us all the time, 
all the time, in the office, when we're cranking out papers, uh, when the, the, the mayor's having to sit at city council and work, and when, uh, and the list goes on, uh, in, in the hospital, um, he's there. That's the great gift of Easter right now. When we talked about the fear of dying and what that does, I mean, the presence of Jesus, even in the act of dying, uh, Daryl, I count on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm buoyed by something that uh, John Newton once said. A woman came to him and said, she's a Christian woman, said, um, Pastor, I am afraid to die. And he said, well, that's quite normal because you're not dying now. But when you're dying, his presence will be there and enough grace will be given to you to do it with great joy. I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that kind of thinking that, that the one who knows death and resurrection. See, I think for a believer, we experience death for a completely different reason. We've already, Christ has already died for us. Why would we physically die? I think we physically die because he calls on us to fully identify with him both in death and in resurrection mm -hmm. so that we live his experience. We're one with him in this. And therefore, I think that when we die, believers are called by Jesus to be fully one with him in the experience of dying. And he who has died for us will take us through those moments as well. We'll be okay. We'll be okay. Well, you know, for, for a long time, people say a death came for him. Yes. <clears throat> They'll use that kind of language. For the believer, that's not true. Yeah. It's Jesus came for him. Yeah. I go to prepare a place for you. When I prepare it, I will come again and take you to myself that you may be where, where I am. So that moment when we die isn't a victory of death. It's Jesus has come. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, people will also use the language, uh, he passed away. Yes. And I, 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 I encourage people, don't use that language. Yeah. But, you what want, should we say? You pass through. Ah. There's this very thin veil between this order of existence and the other in which Jesus is alive. It's very thin veil. Have, heaven and earth are so inextricably intertwined. It's a very thin veil. And when we die, when he comes for us, he pulls us through this veil. So I'm, 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 gonna, I'm coaching my family. Don't say, Daryl passed away. He passed through. Yeah. Jesus, don't say death came. Yeah. Jesus came and he's pulled him through to the other side. Um, was it John 5? He who believes in me has... Already know, passed oh, over. Already passed over. Yeah. And so uh, I think it was Dallas Willard who's, who uh, semi-jokingly said, it'll probably be five to ten minutes after I've died that I realized I died. <laughs> um, because I've just been pulled more deeply oh, into the presence beautiful. of Christ. Um, yeah. Oh, very beautiful. Yeah. So the actual, you know, the actual experience of dying. I mean, I think we we, we fear that. You've you've talked about that. Um, I, I do I do think that there's this, you know, united with Him in His death and in His resurrection might also even refer to the death and the resurrection of the believer. That in this we are united. But it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing for me that mm. to think that, uh, you know, what, what Dr. Willard said, that who, by the way, has done it, right? He's done it. <laughs> He's done it. I mean, by the way, I think there's something about resurrection for a believer that, that we actually, at the death of a believer, we mourn for ourselves, don't we? Oh, we, sure. We're not the mourning loss. for the person. How could we mourn for someone um, who now stands before Christ? and sees him in his glory and sees this is what I was created for in the first place. Yeah. How would we mourn for that? But we lost. But we There's, lost. We have to acknowledge. Yeah. No, but yeah. we mourn for ourselves. The, sure. the loss. The loss of that relationship, the loss of that valued person. <clears throat> as you know, um, as a pastor, that even when people have prayed for Jesus to come and take their sick loved one. And you long for that after days and weeks and you, you rejoice it. Yeah. And then you get the news, they're gone. Yeah, it's just a stab in the heart, still that. But then how to, how to press through those times rejoicing that the loved one is just fine, thank you. Amen. <laughs> and well, there's our hope. Well, um, Daryl, what a joy it is to talk to you. I know that we've just barely touched on these subjects, but I would hope that for anyone listening, 
that that Easter will become more precious to them and that the, that, that the challenge to read more deeply into the word and to believe more deeply would take a, would take a hold. Thank you so much. God Great bless to be you. with you, John. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interviews, episodes, and Bible teaching content. Uh, thanks for joining us today.